Hey everyone, welcome to this session on getting started with serverless, three easy patterns. My name is Natasha Laurie and I'm a software developer at a Cloud Guru. I've been here about a year and a half and it's given me some awesome exposure to AWS and serverless technologies as we run on serverless architecture. In this session, we're going to look at some common patterns that will be useful to know and some tips when we look at the code. If you're new to building applications with serverless, then this will help you spot these patterns and provide some tips when building out services yourself. So in the 20 minutes we've got, we're going to learn about each pattern, have a look at how they're implemented in a common use case, and see a demo of each in action. I did prepare a repo with the demos in that you can follow along with if you like, otherwise you can just watch me on screen. Feel free to fork the repo and you can deploy these services as is, and even extend them if you want to. So today, the three patterns we're going to look at are simple web service, data processing pipeline, and the fan out pattern. There are many more, but I'm showing you these today as these three can help solve really common problems in cloud architecture. Before we look at the patterns in code, I have got some demo prerequisites. So I've already got an AWS account and I'm signed in via the AWS CLI and in the console. I'm using the latest LTS version of Node.js version 12 and I'm also using the serverless framework to deploy my architecture. Uh, you can look into serverless framework in your own time, but just so you know, I'm using it for the purpose of this demo. So let's take a look at our first pattern. So first up is the simple web service, and it's probably one of the most common web centric patterns uh, using Lambda as a backend service. Essentially, the pattern allows our service to receive a public API call, perform some backend logic, and then return a response. So the services that we're using here are API Gateway, Lambda, and DynamoDB. In the diagram, API Gateway receives an API call from a client, uh, and it, ex it exposes the Lambda function via HTTPS. API Gateway can also handle authorization and authentication, among other things, uh, but we're not going to look at that today. So when a request is received via API Gateway, this triggers the Lambda function. The Lambda function will have some kind of logic in it, for example, being able to read or write to the DynamoDB table. Then Dynamo will return the requested data. The use case for our demo is going to be a simple web service for adding new users and getting existing ones from a user table. We'll be using a GET and a POST request to create a new user and get back an existing one from the Dynamo table. Let's take a look at the code. So I mentioned using serverless framework earlier. In case you haven't used it before, um, the serverless framework, it's an open source framework that deploys my code to AWS. And it does that by taking this serverless.yaml file uh, and, and translates it to a AWS CloudFormation template. And then it deploys a CloudFormation stack from that. Uh, and I have actually already deployed this service um, by running SLS deploy and I get my two endpoints um, that I've created, um, but we'll show you how we get to that. So let's have a look at the serverless file. At the top, I've just defined um, what the service is. And a lot of these attributes, you can actually look up on the serverless framework website um, if you're not sure what they are. But if we think back to the diagram, we need a DynamoDB table to store the users in. We need a function to create a new user and we need a function to get an existing user. So if we start down here in the resources section, uh, I need to specify a table to be created. So I've got a table here and we can see we're using things like uh, the ID as a key and a table name being referenced down here as well. Uh, it's using an environment variable called user table which is defined up here under environment, provider environment. Uh, so the name of my table is gonna be the service name, so simple web service, the stage, uh, dev dash users. Um, if we look at the functions section now, we've got two functions called create and get and the handler points to the location of the handler in the code. So under the handlers directory, which we can see to the left here. The event to trigger this Lambda is a HTTP request. 
uh, to the path of users slash create and users slash ID for the get handler. So let's take a look at each function now. Under handlers, I've got the create.js for my create handler. And I'm using the AWS SDK uh, to write to our DynamoDB table. And I'm also using this UUID package to get a unique ID for our new user. Uh, I'm just creating the parameters here. So the table name, we're using the user table environment variable uh, that was made available uh, through here. And then uh, passing the ID, a name and a surname, and then writing it to Dynamo. And looking at the get handler, again, I'm using the AWS SDK to get from our user table. I'm getting the ID from the event parameter. So as well as looking in the documentation, you can also console log these parameters and see what comes back from um, CloudWatch. This is super helpful for debugging. Back to the serverless.yaml file. Finally, we can see we've got some IAM role statements here. So I'm allowing to query, get, and put an item from the user table. In this resource, you'll see that we provide the ARN, so the Amazon resource name, rather than just the table name as well. And that's all the code we need for this demo. One thing I would say about the serverless.yaml is be careful with indentation. Uh, when you deploy it, it will tell you if the indentation is incorrect anyway. Let's take a look at our empty table in the console that's been created. So I've gone to DynamoDB and I've searched for my table, simple web service dev users. So if I click on there, I should get an empty table. Cool. And I'm going to make some requests uh, with my API client to test our endpoints. So uh, I'm using Postman here. And I've already got a post set up. And I've just taken the endpoint from where I, when I deployed earlier here. Uh, so I've taken that post endpoint and I've just going to add a name, Natasha, and surname, Laurie. So when I click send, it's generated a new ID with UUID for me. And if I go back to the table, I've got my new user. Now I can do a get request for that new user. So I'm going to copy the ID and go to my get request that I've got set up here. And remember the ID goes on the end of the path here. So it's users slash the ID. So when I click send, I get my user back. Let's have a look at the other two services in the console. Uh, so we've already checked Dynamo, but we can have a look at API Gateway under networking and content delivery. And I found my uh, API here. And if we click in, we should see that both endpoints have been created. Yep, so the create post and the get here. Also, we can go to Lambda under compute and you can look up the lambdas uh, in CloudWatch to check that they've been evoked. Uh, so here are my two functions. Let's go into one of them. To open CloudWatch, we just go to monitoring and then view logs in CloudWatch. We can check the latest log and we can see that it's been successful. Uh, so this is a good way to check things are working as expected and also to see what data is getting passed to that Lambda by adding some console logs in your handler code. I've got an example of where I've console logged in my handler in the next demo. And that's it for this one. We've got a simple web service with two endpoints that allow us to get and write to the DynamoDB table. Another common use of serverless services is to trigger an action after a specific event occurs. So in this case, the data processing pattern can be used for any data produced by applications, uh, devices, or a user that then needs to be processed before consumed. So in this diagram, we can see we're using two AWS resources, S3 and Lambda. 
Uh, so we can drop an object, for example, an image into the first S3 bucket. This then triggers a Lambda to process it and returns the process image in another bucket. This is exactly what our demo is going to do. So let's take a look at the code. Here's our serverless YAML. Uh, let's remember what we need again. So we need one S3 bucket that an image will be uploaded to. We need a Lambda to resize the image and then another S3 bucket that the resized image will appear in. So at the bottom here, we've got resources where we have a specified resized image bucket. So the bucket that the process image will land in. Uh, next up, We've got functions uh, and inside that we've got the resize image handler. Uh, so its location is in the handler file uh, over here. Uh, we've also got an environment variable called resize image bucket here too. If you mention an environment variable under a specific function, it means it's only made available to that function rather than globally. As we only need it for the Lambda to write the object to the bucket, uh, then we can just specify it here. Uh, now notice how under events we have the upload image bucket referenced. Uh, this is the bucket that acts as a trigger for the Lambda function. So we don't need to add it to the resources as it will get created anyway. So an object being created in the upload image bucket is the trigger for this Lambda. Up above, we have a custom properties section. I've just put the full names of the two buckets here. Uh, you can see I've referenced them throughout this file. And looking at the IAM role statements, uh, we're allowing to get an object from the upload image bucket and put objects to the resized image bucket. There are multiple ways to reference a resource. But in this case, I constructed the ARN myself. Let's take a quick look at the handler. So I'm using the AWS SDK and a package called Sharp, um, and that's going to do the image resizing for me. Uh, and then what I'm doing in here is I'm getting the uh, upload bucket and the key of the image from the event. It's worth mentioning that the event doesn't contain the image itself, only the triggered event metadata. We still have to go and get the image from the bucket, which we're doing with the get object method on line 15. Uh, here I am resizing the image on line 20 using sharp. And finally, I am putting the object to the resized image bucket, uh, referencing that environment variable. So that's it for the code here. Uh, I have added a console log, so we should see that in CloudWatch when we check as well. So let's test it out in the console. Uh, I've gone to S3 already and I filtered out my bucket names. Uh, so I've got the resized image bucket and the upload image bucket. And I've also got uh, Lambda open as well and searched for my Lambda function. So I've got the resize image function here. Uh, so let's see if it works. Uh, I'm going to the upload image bucket and I've got this picture of myself and my friend Irina uh, from React Comp this year. I'm going to drop that in the bucket and click upload. So hopefully once it's done, we should be able to check the other bucket and see that it's been resized. Cool, so first off, I'll just show you the size of this image so we can compare. There we go. And let's find the other one. There we go. Um, React Conf dash resized. Uh, I actually made a little function here that makes the file name so we can see it's created that there. Uh, and if we click on it, it should be a smaller version. Yeah, sweet. And let's check the Lambda. And we can go to CloudWatch. So monitoring view logs in CloudWatch. Uh, 
And there we go. Let's check our latest one. We can see my console log. So resizing image react.comp.jpg. Awesome. So there you have a simple uh, data processing pipeline pattern. Let's check out the final pattern. So the final pattern for this talk is the fanout pattern. And it's most commonly used with messaging and data processing. Uh, with fanout, you only have one entry point. So it could be a Lambda or a HTTP request or an event notification. And that triggers multiple invocations of a serverless function in parallel, or it can invoke Lambdas with different tasks in parallel. Uh, this is great because it means we can do multiple jobs at the same time and save time as well. And there's lots of different use cases with use of different services as well, uh, depending on the problem you're trying to solve. We're going to extend on our first example and introduce SNS. So in this diagram, we're using five resources. We're using API Gateway, Lambda, DynamoDB, SNS, uh, simple notification service, and SES, simple email service. When we create a new user, once it's successfully been written to the table, we publish a message on the SNS topic. This message is received by the two lambdas that are subscribed to the topic, but are then triggered in parallel. This is the fan out bit to send an SMS and an email to the user. We're using SES to send the email. Let's go check out this in the code. We've got a bit more going on in this serverless file. So let's take a look at resources. Here I'm creating an SNS topic. It's name relating to the custom property uh, topic name. So that's defined here. I've also added topic ARN as a custom property. I need to provide my AWS account ID uh, as part of this ARN. So I'm using a plugin called serverless pseudo parameters to allow us to use CloudFormation pseudo parameters. Uh, so this lets me get the account ID like this. And the same as the other demo, uh, we're also creating a user table. So I've done that here in the resources as well. Then if we look at functions, we've got three functions. So we've got create, and that's using um, the topic ARN environment variable here. Rather than global IAM role statements, I'm using a plugin called serverless IAM role per function, which allows us to set least privileged permissions to each function. It's best practice to have a least privileged setup for your Lambda functions. So we could go back and refactor some of the previous examples to use this as well. Uh, the event that triggers this function is a HTTP request to user slash create. We've then got a send email function using a send an email environment variable. And uh, this uh, is set to an environment variable called sender email address coming from a .n file. So the email address that I want to send emails from, I'm storing in here. I'm using another plugin called serverless.env plugin, as this allows you to preload environment variables from the .env file into your serverless config. It'll inject these environment variables into your Lambda functions. And you can just reference them like this, so env colon and then the environment variable. I'm also giving this function an IAM role to allow us to send email with an NCS ARN resource. The event that triggers this function is the SNS topic. For send SMS, our IAM role statement is a little trickier to lock down as there's not an SMS resource to target. Uh, here we're denying publishing to topics and applications. And here we're allowing publishing to the rest, which leaves SMS. I mentioned a few plugins that we're using in this service and all you need to do to use them is install them with NPM and then you reference them under this plugin section here. Let's take a look at each handler now. So in the create.js file, all we're doing is adding a new user. This time we're taking an email and a phone number. We're then writing that item to the DynamoDB table. Once we've written the item to the table, we're publishing a message uh, on the SNS topic. 
and the message just contains uh, the item. In send email, we're getting the SNS message from the event and using some of the data from it to put in our email template here. So we're using the full name and the email address we want to send to. Our source down here is the sender email environment variable that we made available uh, in the serverless YAML file. And then we're sending the email. In send SMS, we're getting the SNS message from the event and using the full name and phone number from the data. When we pass these parameters to SNS publish, it knows to send an SMS. That's it for the code. Let's have a look in the console. I'm going to start by making a request in Postman to the endpoint that I was given once the service had been deployed. So we make the post request and we send the full name, email, and a phone number, and that writes it to the DynamoDB table. So if we go to the table now and refresh, we see our user. And on success of this create, two worker functions receive a message from the SNS topic of the table item in. So here's the topic in the console with the send email and send SMS lambdas subscribed to it. These lambdas are invoked in parallel and we can check them out in CloudWatch. So here are the logs. So we can open each log. So here are the latest log events for the send email and send SMS. So very close start times. Let's check we got the email and SMS. So I'm actually using a disposable email and SMS service uh, and we can see we've received the email here and go over to the text service and we've got the text message through here as well. It's important to note with SES, the email address you send from and to need to be verified due to the sandbox restrictions. So here I've got the two email addresses that I've verified already. If you're using this service in production, you can request to be removed from this environment so you don't have to verify to email addresses, but you still need to verify from email addresses. The important thing here is our service invokes multiple worker processes in parallel from one entry point, and that's our fan out pattern. And that's what I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. It's good to follow along, but there's nothing better than having a go yourself, so feel free to fork the repo. You can deploy the services as is, extend on them, or recreate these patterns from scratch yourself. Thanks for listening.